Hi everyone. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you for joining and watching the film and supporting it and being part of this amazing panel. I'm going to introduce the panel right now. So we have Femi, who is the co-writer, filmmaker and the presenter of African Apocalypse. We also have Professor Kayindi Andrews of uh, Professor of Black Studies at BCU. We have Ash, who is a writer and mental health advocate. And we have Sarah Garvey, who is a social commentator, presenter, and all round feather ruffler. That was a mouthful. So we're gonna dive right in. We are gonna be taking questions from the audience. So if you have any questions that you wanna to put to the panel, please put them in the chat and we will get those uh, read out. So Femi, tell us a little bit about um, where this all started and how you got to write the, um, the film African Apocalypse, which is amazing by the way, it's a super deep, deep film and so well done. You're on mute, Femi. That's yeah, it. let me unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been working on this film with a guy called Rob now for many years. Um, I was, um, as you all already know, I'm not going to have to recount the story of my, my life because you've just <laughs> you've just been see seeing part of it for the last one and a half hours. But I was a student at um, Oxford University um, and I, um, off the kind of, off the off, basically while I was at Oxford, I got involved in anti-colonial activism um, around in a movement called Roads Must Fall. Um, and I was performing and writing poetry and the rest of it in, in French at an open mic night near to um, where um, my houseboat is in Oxford. Um, and Rob's partner was actually in the audience and she knew that he had been interested in making a film um, around colonialism for a while. So we ended up meeting and discussing um, France-Afrique, which is the, the kind of French colonial history and present that continues to this day, um, and the Voulez saint juan mission in particular. Um, and um, we got more and more into it. And then we ended up going to Niger and, and, and making this, this film um, about the Voulez saint juan mission. Um, and yeah, it was really obviously, it's, it's, been, it's been many <laughs> years in the making um, and a, a, a kind of a very, a very, define an experience um, and I'm hopefully the first of many because this is only one story of what are a huge amount of stories across the continent with 2,000 languages um, and um, over 50 countries and, 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 and a very 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 diverse and interesting history. Most definitely and one of the things that I really loved about the film was I felt that the narration was very poetic and um, it was it was it, there, there was a kind of like rhythm to it as well. So I just wanted to point that out. We'll go to um, Kayindi. Kayindi, what did you think of the film? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say I enjoyed the film, but I guess that's not really the point. Like, it was deeply disturbing. Um, I'm actually just so I have a book coming out in February and I've been doing the audio, recording the audio book this week. So it's like properly fresh in my mind. And the book's all about the history, right? Like, like how the West is still built on racism and writing that book and watching, watching the film is really clear that we have a picture of some of us have a picture of the general like the general it was bad but when you actually look at the detail uh, it's the devil is in the detail let's put it that way and so actually seeing the seeing just how brutal it was um it's still shocking it's still, it's still shocking even when you know uh so much but you need but we need but we need those stories because there is such a bad understanding of what empire is when 60% of the British public think that the British Empire was a force for good, it just tells you just how bad their understanding of empire is. Because that that film, you could have gone anywhere, literally on the African continent, and you would have had the, you would have had the same stories. Um, but we just kind of have this idea of what the empire is. Some yeah, maybe it was a little bit bad, but it was generally good, and they built roads and da da da, and they built civilization, etc. Um, and if the film just shows it in all its in all its brutality, um, which is which is important because. A, not so important historically, but B, I think the film was really good because it showed us um, what the country's like today. I mean, it's, it's not really changed, right? It's still terrible. And these are still the legacies that we have to, to live through. 
Yeah, I think that's a key point. It's the legacy of colonialism and imperialism that we are still living out. And I, I totally agree and echo what you say that I don't think there is a proper understanding of it. It's kind of like empire for Britain or for the West is an amazing thing, but actually all the indigenous and native people that they killed, maimed, um, enslaved. <laughs> so it's still quite a lot of process. Why was that? That's that ridiculous program, Good Morning Britain. And just, you know, point out that the British Empire, is, you can't really compare the Nazis to the British Empire because the British Empire was far worse. It lasted for a ridiculous amount of the time, killed way more people. And actually some of the techniques that the Nazis used directly come from colonialism, right? There's a very clear link to colonialism mm -hmm. and Nazis. Um, but having, saying that, you'd think, I don't know, like think I'd criticize Jesus or something, like, because people just don't have that conceptual framework. Um, and I think a, a really there was, I can't remember which bit it was in the movie. It was when the um, the French, the, the, when the guy that went to capture him got killed and they put a, um, a, a statue up for him. This became an issue. Yeah. Prior to that point, they didn't, he was the first person that was killed. Like that, and that is conceptually what Europeans think. He was the first, nobody else was killed. The other people, they don't count. All the, the women, the children, they're yeah. not really people. It's only, only white people have full humanity. And that really yeah. is still what we, how we believe. And we don't, even the term Holocaust only comes into existence when the Jews are killed in those big numbers, even though this is happening for, for oh, what, at least 200 years pre previously, but there was no concept of Holocaust because they just didn't really think we were human beings, right? And, yeah. and it just, the film just showed that really well. I guess. It did, it did, it depicted. And it, it, I think as well, another thing, like you said, um, all the people that had been killed, and it's almost like, it's that humanization of the black skin, you know, and we, our ancestors, we, we are people, we are real human beings. What really stood out for me was, it was very early on and it was the, I think it was the father looking at the foot and the hand of a little, you know, and th th there were pictures of it, you know, black people hanging on trees, the dehumanizing of bodies, black bodies and all these kind of things. So thank you for that. I'm gonna move to Ash. What did you think of the film? I thought the film was amazing. Not not obviously because the history is obviously distressing but I mean like just in terms of how it was narrated um I thought it was interesting like just the different sorts of like um viewpoints or like perspectives that were shown also in the um in the film there's a few things that I found very interesting um I think I like the fact that it talked about neocolonialism as a thing so it wasn't necessarily just talking about the past it also linked into things and the manifestations of colonialism today so it mentioned like the 2014 the um the fact that it was uh, uranium was sent from um niger tanks tax free to uh, france if i recall the facts correctly um and just things like that i thought was really interesting because i think when we look at the history of colonialism we see it as like a far removed thing but to look at like neocolonialism how it manifests today and um, was very interesting and i also liked um i thought it was interesting the fact that um, you know, Boko Haram as well was something that was mentioned and featured and, and talked about as a as a as a thing. And I thought that was interesting because um, it also sort of like shows the manifestations of colonialism as well. Um, and it just shows how important it is that we talk and discuss about these things. And another thing that sort of like kind of like I I felt heavily in the in the documentary was this racial trauma that we've sort of carried and we've not actually addressed um and i i just kind of saw like even just through the locals talking about the experiences of i remember someone recalling like an old man that they spoke to about their experiences being um, a witness in a lot of like um the devastation caused by colonialism and um it was very interesting like just seeing how emotionally like invested they are in these in what's happened and it just shows you that like this racial trauma has been passed on and it's something that we haven't addressed um so i thought it was um a really amazing um film for that reason of course it was um it's not nice to hear but i think it's necessary and important it definitely and i think you've hit the nail on the head about racial trauma and how that can also impact on our mental health, even in our day-to-day -day life and the processes. I think it was Franz Brennan that talked about it. I can't remember what book it was. It might have been, Kayindi, you can help me here. White, uh, white Skins, Black Masks. White Masks. That's it. And he talks about white the mental masks. process 
that we go through and I was able to talk about that like even if I'm in a shop and someone's dealing with me in a particular way and I have to process is it is it is it because I'm black is it because of this is it because of that and literally have to do that so quickly but that's all to do with the trauma that we've experienced from racism so I think that is a very key point and one of the things I'll be keeping to see is I remember the campaign about why is my curriculum so white and it would be really interesting to see this film introduced to the curriculum especially at academic level where it can be discussed and people can get that real um, understanding of what we are dealing with okay straight to you now Sarah um, first of all I want to thank Femi for making the movie um, um, not only was it a movie, it was a journey into his own thought processes. Um, so thank you very much. Um, secondly, what the movie done for me was highlight the, um, the colonial history of Niger, not only European colonial history, but also the Arab Muslim colonial history, um, because a lot of that country was actually... Um, uh, under Islamic, I guess, a lot of Muslim. And um, I think a lot of the time we tend to forget that, you know, Arabs were the first to enslave black people before European. Um, uh, the thing is they done it in and around the seventh, seventh century. And um, I think the reason why we focus so much on the European um, enslavement because it's more new um however if he was definitely an emotive and you know thought-provoking journey into the history of africa i've studied african history myself for the past 10 years um so uh, a lot of the stuff in there was like a, a reminder of the stuff that you know maybe two three years ago i read and i'm like oh yes, okay yeah yeah that did happen do you know what i mean um so yeah, um, overall, I think it's definitely needed. Um, I think it's definitely something that should go on the curriculums, uh, or you know, part of part and parcel of the um, university curriculum at least for um, students to see exactly how uh, the the interaction between Africans and Europeans were. Um, so yeah, overall, listen, I cannot fault I cannot fault the movie and. I just want to say again, thank you to Femi for making it. Fabulous. So, kind of, do you think it's something that should definitely be on the curriculum? Well, it's not going to be. So, I'll just be honest with you right now. Like, it should be. Like, I mean, it should be. And it, generally, the, the this history just should be in general. But yeah. there is a the reason it's not is it's on purpose, right? Like, this is a it's not accidental that we don't hear these stories of colonial brutality um, because they would undo all of the lies and the myths that were told right like the whole basis of what we have today is that it's all progressive and science and reason it wasn't it great uh, but actually when you understand that that was all built on the bodies of million, tens of millions hundreds of millions uh black and brown people across the world it kind of it kind of ruins the story so hey, it should be but I know I'm say, it's not going to be right because that's 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 the sad thing look it is quite sad. I remember um, in 2000, I think it was in 2017, I think Femi, you actually performed at the Past Is Now at the Birmingham mm -hmm. Museum. Yeah, and so what we had done is we had curated, because I mean, you know, Birmingham Museum and Birmingham's connection to uh, colonialism and empire is quite rich. And so we went rummaging around the university, um, the museum, and we put on a very, it was quite a small, it was a story lab exhibition where we looked at the Birmingham links and we tried to show how, you know, Birmingham itself was involved in um, Britain's colonial past. And um, one of the things we had, there was like a whiteboard where people could put like post-it notes and they could write comments and things like that. And one of the comments was, why do we need to know this? And I think for me to be uh, an adult in Britain in 2018 at the time, 2017 at the time, I was really disappointed um, to see that somebody said, why do we need to know this when this is actually part of world history? It's not African history, it's not this history, it's actually part of world history. And I think that history itself has been so biased because it's who's writing, who's writing the story and who's telling the films, even the heart of darkness. Um, 
it it didn't give the um it didn't give africans their own voice but african apocalypse has so i think that's a really like key point for us to bear in mind now i have some questions we were having this amazing discussion just before we um <clears throat> everyone was uh, the audience were brought in and i want to really ask you about the immortalization of key figures in history so we've you started rose must fall which was to remove the Cyril Rose um, statue. Um, <clears throat> is it on Oxford High Street or is it actually on the, it's on the high street, isn't it? It's not on the, in, on the it's university. It's on high street, right? yeah. On the high street. So in order As to in make- that's, it is on, it's, No, it's on the side facade of one of the university colleges. Right, brilliant. It's overlooking it, the high street. It, so it is in a way on university <laughs> property. But yeah, you mm. can see it from the high street. Okay, so it's one of the things the roads must fall. And what we've seen, obviously, during the BLM protests was the toppling of the Ed, Ed, uh, Edward, Corson, um, Edward Corston's statue in Bristol. And do you think we should remove these statues? Or do you think we should have like the statue and a little addendum next to it? Is it important yeah. that we keep these statues to remember who these people were in the history? Now, this has been a massive debate. So I want to hear from all of you. If you've got any questions in the audience, you pop those in the chat and we will get to them. So what do you think about the removal of the statues or should we keep them? Should we remove them? Uh, I think, think, and also this kind of leads in terms of immortalizing people in history, what you've just Said about the curriculum right and why do we need to know that if i said divorced beheaded died divorced beheaded survived i'm sure that 80 percent in this chat would know what i was talking about because in school we're all taught about henry the eighth and how he how he got rid of all all of his wives <laughs> in subsequence why do i need to know that <laughs> why do i need to why, why on earth do i need to know that why on earth do i need to know about these random bits of medieval um english history that have no real um consequence on 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 the, on the modern world and then not know about what england did um, um, and what someone like Cecil Rhodes did. Um, and I th think the very fact that Cecil Rhodes is not in our curriculum, but he is on the high street, shows what the statue is. It shows that they're not interested in teaching about the crimes of Cecil Rhodes or about the crimes of Colston. They're not really interested in teaching about the British history, like the role of people like Colston in, 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 in Britain's role in the slave trade, unless they're teaching about William Wil Wilberforce and how Britain supposedly was the first to abolish the slave trade, although actually um, Haitians abolished the slave trade by, by, by having a revolution <laughs> and overthrowing the actual slavers. Excellent. Um, Sarah? In that. They're interested. But they're, oh, sorry, you cut out. Okay. I was get sorry. I, did you, where did you get? Did you did you hear the bit about the Haitians? So I said yeah. they're not interested. They're in, they're not interested in Britain. Um, yeah, so they're not interested in that. What they're interested in is immortalizing people who have given a lot of money, and the fact that a lot of donors threatened to pull money out when this whole Rose Must Fall debate came up in 2015 is testament to the fact that these donors are like, oh well, maybe if I'm donating money in order to have my my um, hall built in this college or my name put on this thing however many years in the future maybe they'll take my name off the, the fact of the matter is you aren't preserving history by having a statue of someone dressed as a roman emperor as is the statue of christopher codrington in all souls college in and barbados you're not you're not preserving history what you're doing is you're you're putting up a monument to this person because he's given you a lot of money and and having history means putting People in textbooks means putting things on the uh, You wouldn't have a statue of Hitler, would you? No one would debate about having a statue of Hitler. No one would debate about having a statue of people who we all agree universally are bad people. So maybe the problem isn't about the statue. The problem is about our perception of who bad people are. Brilliant, good point. I like that. It's, our, it's the, our perception of who bad people are and who we're choosing to make statues of. Um, and it's interesting, the whole debate about, because I always think when it comes to Hitler, it's almost like a default. Oh, well, we wouldn't do that for Hitler and we wouldn't do that for Hitler. But it's so it's an interesting point to note. Sarah, I'm going to go to you. What do you think about the statue? Um, on the Hitler point, I'd say um, if uh, the Nazis did conquer where well, they wanted to conquer, there would definitely be statues of Hitler. Um, so we get that exception. And uh, the reason why people like Cecil Rhodes and Colson are up mm -hmm. is down to perception. 
um, society sees these people to be good people, you know. And um, I'm not for the taking down of statues personally, you know, um, specifically because I think that people need to know the history of the world. And once you know the history of the world, you can come to your own conclusions. So black people can look at Cecil Rhodes, they can look at Edward Colson and come to their own conclusion. However, we are on UK soil. We can't deny that we're on UK soil. Um, the UK, I guess, uh, revered these people to some degree. Um, so let them be. You know, I don't agree with what they've done. 100% I do not agree with what they've done. However, my children may need to understand the history of these people. And so when my children need to understand the history of these people, I can take my children and say, look, this guy did X. They may not tell you that he done X, but this is the guy that done X. And I think that when you start to erase history, um, which, was, which happened to us as African people, our history was erased. And so what happens is when you start to erase history, what you start to do is you start to um, erase the memory of people and people forget, they forget how they actually got to this actual place where they are right now. So I'm not about erasing history, I'm about keeping history alive. And I'm also about telling both sides of history. That's just me. I think that is a key point about telling both sides of history. However, I think here in Britain, that isn't done. We don't have statues of other key people that were very influential. Um, okay, yeah, we have Nelson Mandela, but what about what about the people that made a difference here and were very um, the resistance? I think that's what's missing with these statues. There's no resistance there. There's yeah, there's but sorry to cut you. It's not for the UK government to do that. It is not. It's been, um, it's been nowhere in their manifesto to tell the other side of history. We all know that history is told by this. Um, and so it's for us, people, people like Femi, you know what I mean? It's for people like me, you, to tell the other side of history, to actually ask for the UK government or the UK people or the monarchy or whoever it is to tell the side of history that hasn't been told. For me, it says you really don't know who you're dealing with because these are the same people that actually colonized you. They're not going to tell the story of their own bar 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 barbaric and you know like uncivilized ways. It just doesn't make for good, you know, storytelling. So I would say people like Femi, people like you, people like I, people like the people on this path to tell the other side of history, but never, ever expect for the UK government to tell the other side of history. Fabulous. What I would say, though, is that um, in doing things like Roads Must Fall, we are in a way doing that because no one has spoken more about who Cecil Rhodes was than after we started to in the UK media than after um, Colston statue was forcibly ripped down and no one was asking for um, the UK government to take, well, people were asking for the UK government to take down Colston. Then they got tired of asking and they took it down themselves and chucked it in the river, right? Um, and, and so that kind of, that kind of, um, so, so, so the, these conversations are sparked by direct action. If you look back to the Birmingham protests in, in, in Alabama, Martin Luther King purpose utilized um, the brutal actions that he knew the police were going to put on protesters to cause a national conversation and so sometimes we're not expecting Oriel College to actually come with its hands out and say okay great we're going to take this statue down we're expecting to have to push and push and push and cause a national conversation that's going to move the boundaries of what colonialism can be which is why in 2015 when we asked for the statue to come down people were talking about Rhodes as a benefactor and why in 2020 when the conversation restarted the starting point was Rhodes as a colonizer because we'd already moved the goalposts of who Rhodes was when we had that national conversation five years before. I will say I, I am all for having these national conversations and Ash and Kayindi, I'm going to come to you about this and then we'll get on to the next question. Um, I am all for having these national conversations. And I think I just want to say that when we did Boycott the Human Zoo, this was also this, this debauchery of putting live actors in cages to talk about 
colonialism and the impacts and it was all very important and that was the most successful because the Barbican decided to cancel the not the protesters the Barbican decided to cancel the exhibition that was the most successful campaign that um, black people had had here in the UK in the last 30 years okay and that was because we had to protest and petition and demand. We were going on the telly. We were, I mean, Kayinda, you were writing articles. We were lobbying the city of London to stop this exhibition going ahead because it wasn't telling a story that was from the victim's point. It was actually showing us as being quite, um, it was showing us like we were, we, we'd acquiesced to this inhumane treatment. It never ever showed the resistance. And I think after that then came Rose Must Fall and we're still having conversations. Nothing is actually changing. That's my gripe. Moving to you, uh, Kayundi, what's your point on the statues? Um, well, I mean, look, statues aren't history. So I think that's just the first thing to say, like the point of statues is to cele celebrate and memorialize particular things. You don't learn anything from going to a statue. And that's not the purpose of a statue. And if you look at why these statues are put up, it's, it's not to maintain history. So taking down all of these statues does not change the historical record at all. Uh, history is in books, it's everywhere, it's, 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 it's around, right? Um, so, you know, if we do want, and I, they, I do say if, I think this is where I would say, if if you really do want a, a anti-racist public space, you shouldn't have slave traders and colonists and murderers, they just don't do it, right? Take them down. But on the other hand though, and this is, I guess, um, I remember being in um, Brussels, and there was these activists who were taking us around the, the um, Leopold statue. And Leopold comes up a bit in the movie. Leopold's uh, just appalling, right? Like a, this yeah. appalling figure, he just kills, he doesn't even go to, anyway, whatever, but anyway. So, yeah. you know, Leopold, and they're, they're, so their they're protest is about taking down the statues. But then they're saying, well, actually, though, we kind of like the statues because the statues remind us what this place is. And I think that's the, like, the biggest danger you have with taking the statues down is, it allows you that you can take down a statue and say we've made progress. We haven't actually made any progress if you don't change the basic fundamentals of the society. Sure. And in some ways, the best people to represent modern Britain are Col is Colston. The best person to, 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 to represent the West probably is Christopher Columbus and uh, Leopold's probably quite a good, repre good, good representation of uh, modern uh, Belgium. So I can see, I can see, actually I can see both sides on this, right? Like these really yeah. are the people you should be revering if we understand what the system is. Um, sure. But I'm totally with Femi that, that you make these campaigns, it's not really about the statue at all. It's actually about trying to draw attention to the, to the bigger issues, right? It most definitely, and I agree. I, I, I mean, I can see both sides. Personally, I think there should be an addendum put next to the statues that actually talk about what these people actually did. Um, or we put them in museums and we put an addendum so that people know it's not this, it's also this. So there is that both sides, whether we get that or not. 100% uh, for having it in a museum. I think that we're down on everyone and you put it in a museum, it's easier to contextualize. Because if you go to a museum and you walk past something, you read the little plaque which talks about it. You look at the thing. If you go, if you're walking down the street and you look at something, you just see a big statue on a thing. You don't know where the plaque is. If it's next to the thing, and the statue is two feet up, two stories up in the air, then you're not going to read it. If it's if it's on the wall, you're not going to read it. A museum is the perfect place to have a historical thing and contextualize it where people can go and they can go, oh, cool, what's this? How does it work? British museums are full of stuff they stole from all over the world and they managed to contextualize them. <laughs> they managed to take things from Nigeria, the Benin bronzes, and contextualize them in a the museum. Why not contextualize your own? <laughs> yeah, contextualize your own but, yeah. history. And I also think as well, there is that kind of like height difference thing. They're very much looming over people. You don't know where the plaque is. Sometimes it's just the name of the birth date and so on. Okay, quickly to you, Sha um, Ash, and then we're going to move on. I don't really have much to say about the statues because I feel like there's more important issues to talk about. Um, so I don't really want to go mm -hmm. too much into it. But I would say for me, the statues is like a glorification of history. Like I am proud the fact that I supported the 
um, the empire. I'm proud of the fact that I, um, you know, supported the slave trade. So for me, that's what the statues represent. Um, I think any form of direct action is necessary and important. So protest to remove statues is fundamental because it creates a shift in um, consciousness for some people. It also provides like more attention on the issue, meaning that people are more inclined to research and look into what's going on, which um, Femi mentioned that, you know, due to the fact that there was the roles conversation, there was more conversations leaning towards like um, talking about colonialism and stuff like that. So we can clearly see that direct action is a positive thing because it leads towards something. But I think like for me, the statues should go, of course. Um, I think for me, fundamentally, it's about like, how could we, how can we do the direct action of removing statues while simultaneously having conversations about the fact that the fabrics of this society is, you know, deeply entrenched in colonialism, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I feel like um, those are the sorts of conversations that I would like to have more leaning towards like outside of that, which is necessary and important. I'm not trying to downplay the, the need to take down statues, but I feel like that is a thing and it's necessary to take it out, but then also like, okay, what other forms of action can we take to sort of like, unlearn and dismantle um yeah like it, you know what i'm talking about like this I do. Is whole system basically and uh, the deconstruction of a colonialism okay so <clears throat> what was i going to say uh we are going to move on to the next question and then we're going to take questions from the audience they can put di direct questions to you and 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 stuff like that so there was the voice the kidnapped woman which I thought was so uh prominent in in the film you Femi are listening to a recording uh, uh of in 1970 and what I often find um is that when we're looking at colonialism and slavery and stuff like that sometimes the voice of the woman often gets lost and uh, that's why, um, yeah, the voice of the woman often gets lost. So I'm going to put it to you, Ash. How might women experience the effects of colonialism and racism differently to men? That's an interesting <laughs> question, and it's multi-layered. So I don't know where to start. Um, how how do they deal with it? Um, I would just say um, gender gender norms and um, standards and expectations. Um, you know, I think we are so entrenched in this patriarchal way of, um, you know, seeing how women, like basically these roles of like how women should be and men should be. And a lot of those sort of like ideals are rooted in imperialism and rooted in colonialism. And those sorts of ideas are, um, are inherited from people who are not necessarily from our culture. So I'll say like just the day-to-day -day sort of like, expectations that are placed upon women we're like having to sort of play into that and not question like where are these like norms coming from so i'll say like there's there's a multi-layer of things um but i'll say just like fundamentally how we um, are expected to act as women um and another thing i'll say like is just especially as black women just like the expectation that we're supposed to just get on with things and we're going to be okay and it's that whole like racial trauma but also like the the sexism as well the aspect of like black women have gone through all this trauma yet we're supposed to we're expected just to continue going on with life and just dealing with it um so those are sorts of like i think also roots of like colonialism and imperialism definitely and the impact on mental health in the whole community Kayindi, what are the effects between uh both black men and women, what are the, what are the impacts? Um, yeah, so unfortunately, historically, we look back, we just, we have really blinkered eyes, like history is his story, right? And we just really do often miss out the stories of women. Now, women are there for all of the issues of colonialism, slavery, etc. cetera. Um, women, there's, I mean, it's, what are the impacts? The impacts are, what's the, there's a really great book called A Kick in the Belly by um, Stella Dadzi. I have that out. on order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. worth. And um, she's telling the story of slavery in the Caribbean, uh, in the Caribbean in particular. And there's this one bit in there which just blew my mind completely. Where So after the abolition of the slave trade, so basically 
because of Haiti, actually, Haiti frees itself. And then one of the reasons Haiti frees itself is because some, like about two thirds of the enslaved were from Africa, directly from Africa. Um, There's also a civil war in Congo at the time. So a lot of people were warriors. And the narrative became, well, this was, an, this was because we had all these Africans. We hadn't seasoned them. We, hadn't bre- we need to breed our own enslaved. Then it's easier to, they're easier to manage. Uh, mm-hmm. So the, that's why the British say, well, let's stop importing <clears throat> people uh, and just breed, breed the enslaved, basically, which is why slavery kind of carries on for like 30 years after it. Um, but what happens after they abolish the slave trade is that the birth rate plummets on British, in the British Caribbean, plummets. I just, like, it, was, it was a particular rate here and it dies down. And then after slavery ends, it goes back up again. And so actually what we think is that women were actually saying, no, we're just not gonna breed. Like, we're, just, we're just not going to do it. You won't have any more kids. And one of the reasons that it just never gets rid, I, this is the first time I'd ever come across this even as conceptually. One of the, the, that's one of the reasons that slavery gets abolished in the British Caribbean, because they just don't have enough, they've stopped the trade. Women aren't breeding, they ain't no people, so they ain't got a choice, and there's rebellions, and so they ain't got a choice. So we're given this kind of story about it's all uh, these white men and abolition, et cetera, and no, it wasn't. It was resistance, and it was, and women were heavily involved in it. Um, so when you look through this history differently, you see a completely different picture. And actually, that's, that's one, one snippet from that, which is fascinating, um, which does show you about maternity, and also the, the, the dark side of that is, the sexual violence that is just a feature. And actually one thing that I, I, I guess didn't come through, didn't come through that much in the movie actually, but I imagine was a huge part of, a huge part of the French ex- ex- expedition uh, through Niger, through Niger as well. Um, so yeah, women are there, women are there in resistance, women are there in the bad, women are there, women are just there. And we just need to tell the story <laughs> we much, often much better. Don't rem- and, and I think one of the key points that I want to point out as well, oh, some of the impacts um, of, of, uh, colonialism on women was rape being used as a weapon of war and um, the fact that children were born out of sexual violence and so this trauma that we talk about uh, whether we call it post-traumatic stress and trauma responses and things like that this was passed down generation to generation to generation because it's in our DNA and I think that often gets lost as well and then we sort of engage in this this online battle of the sexes sometimes um but when we're looking at it the influences and if you look back in history and you look at harmonious um african communities and cultures women were quite highly revi- um, revered and recognized and, and and very powerful you know even in some of the spiritualities a lot of the deities are female so you know, i think in the film. Of- Sorry, Sorry go film, it talks about it talks about female spirits um, mm-hmm. in the trees and a lot of the spirits that are talked about in the trees, the Iskoki, um, are it. female as well. There's a woman who we met um, who didn't make it to the final cut, but um, was a descendant of the Sarauña. There's another film about um, uh, this same kind of mission, a fictional mm-hmm. Um, called Salonia and the Salonia of the time was the warrior queen in, in one of the house regions in Niger who led yeah. one of the big uh, revolts against Vule. So even along our trip and in the particular history of Vule Shamwan there's specific um, specific revolts against um, Vule, Paul Vule, who were led by these kind of female warrior um, queen types and even though modern day Niger partly because of the um, the the uh, influence of, as as has been mentioned, kind of Arab um, colonialism in history, um, can sometimes, it was often the case that we'd have to go and we'd have to go and speak to the man. <laughs> we'd have to go and speak to the men of the village and the rest, because it's a quite a Muslim country in some ways and quite traditional in other ways in the rest. Um, although we did have a very strong female lead in Amina, and we have the schoolgirls and we have plenty of women who we talk to throughout the film. Um, uh, still, a lot of the resistance against Paul Vule came from um, came from women in the particular um, story that we're looking at now. Just to... fabulous, and I also think as well. There's a, a, especially uh, in terms of resistance, especially here in sort of uh, the UK, and we also have obviously Nani Maroons of the West Indies and stuff, the Caribbean. Um, what I've noticed here now in terms of what I see a lot of black women doing is they are reclaiming their African spirituality. And that's another form of resistance for me. That's another way because the impact was, obviously it was Christianity. Um, it was falling into Western rules um, with how we operated. Let's go to the man, the woman 
is, you know, so you have women and especially black women were going lower and lower and lower. So seeing this rebirth of an, emb an embracing of, uh, especially like Yoruba traditions, um, Ifa, Santa, um, Santa, Santorina, and um, I've forgotten the other one, I can't remember now, but there's this rebirth. And I think that's quite beautiful in forms of resistance. Quickly to you, Sarah, and then we're gonna take questions from the audience. Yeah, I mean, clearly, um, I've always said that women are the keeper of the secrets of history. Um, that's just my own personal thing. I think um, in a patriarchal society, um, women, a lot of the time, women sit on the side and they do everything. Um, when soldiers come in home, the soldiers are the ones to... I guess have the pillow talk with their with their woman. Um, the leaders are the ones to tell a woman to be quiet, and but she views everything. So, um, women's role in, um, in this thing, I believe, is huge. And I think the best stories will probably come from women. If I'm totally honest, that's just my personal view. I think the best stories actually come from women who have them and seen the things that maybe men don't want to say. You know, but they're always around every question around personal view. Fabulous. So we're going to take some uh, questions from the audience. Um, they're going to be read out. So I'm just waiting for the tech to read the questions out for us. So together films when you're ready. All right. Our first question is from YV. Other than research papers, is there any evidence of European investment into Africa or diasporans on a wide scale? I'll put that to you, Femi. You're on mute, honey. You're on mute. Cool. Yay. So, other, so just to reference the question again, other than research papers, is there any evidence of, can you just repeat the question? Is there any evidence of European investment into Africa or diasporans on a wide scale? Um, I think that um, Europeans are te still taking from Africa. <laughs> I mean, they claim to invest. There's foreign direct investment. There's there's charity. There's the rest. But in the same time, with the other hand, there's there's massive tax um, evasion, which is aided abetted and abetted. Well, that European companies do on the continent. There's, um, there's structural adjustment policies whereby the IMF and the World Bank um, basically force African countries to, 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 to implement certain policies um, by leveraging debt on them, which grows year after year after year um, and is based on the initial theft that the European nations did. So it's like, cool, we've colonized you, we've finished colonizing you, now we're going to lend you back some of what we stole and we're going to add loads of interest to that debt so it'll keep growing and then when you can't pay that off okay fine well we'll force you to um liberalize your economy and the rest and so i think yeah there's plenty of examples kind of special examples we can give of european countries even to today investing in um formerly colonized african nations but the fact of the matter is that in much larger ways um and the example given in the film is the example of the french uranium um com french national um, electric electric company basically um, forcing Euro Niger to give it uranium tax-free so that it can use it for its own domestic nuclear um, energy program and Europeans take a lot more than they give um, still till today. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, Kaindi, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I mean the, the Europeans have always invested into Africa so they can take stuff out of you. And that's yeah. exa exactly the same. No, it's the be best return on your investment is uh, pillaging the African continent. It is. It's like that. It's still like that continued scramble for Africa. Let's take all of its resources. Let's absolutely <laughs> break its land completely until there's nothing left. Sarah, do you want to add? Have you got uh, anything to add? Yeah. I mean, this kind of uh, speaks to a notion of independence. Um, uh, the African continent celebrates, many countries in the African continent celebrate independence every year. And I'm yet to see an independent African nation. Like if we really think about it, I'm yet to see an independent African nation because um, all African nations are, for want of a better term, still slaves to their colonial masters um via via their economy 
um, I forget, I don't, Ivory Coast, I forget the uh, African country who still has their, um, Femi might be able to help me, who still has their uh, currency printed in Paris. Um, it's not just African one. Countries. I think it's 14 different, okay. there's the West African and the Central African franc, mostly basically all the ex-French African colonies. All the um, Francophone the countries, yeah. Yeah, all the Francophone countries, they still, they still print it in Paris. <laughs> I didn't even uh, yeah, know that. So, I didn't even yeah, know so that. Wow. Yeah, so their current their currency is still printed in Paris. So, you know, if and when, you know, Paris say, hang on, you are not doing what we want you to do, you can actually cut off your currency to your country. Like you are you are not independent. And um yeah, I just think it speaks to independence. I think we need to kind of really shift our focus on what real independence actually is for African okay. countries. That's just my thing. No, I agree. What is independence? When we say independence, what do we really mean? What are we asking for? You know, that's that's a very, very good point. Ash, is there anything you want to move on that you want to say? And then we'll take the next question. No, I'm OK. I think everyone covered it pretty well. Brilliant. Brilliant. Should we take the next question? All right. Next question is, how do we confront the ethics behind the continued institutionalization of a racist text like Heart of Darkness? Kayindi. I'm going to put that to um, you. Uh, so there's a chapter in my new book, uh, which is called I'm White, Therefore I Am. And it really just, look, you go through all the, like, the, the basic foundations of knowledge are, are deeply racist. Not even like a little bit. This is, again, a bit like the film where you kind of know it's bad. And then when you actually read it, you're like, geez, this is way worse than I possibly could have imagined. Um, so, like, it wouldn't just be one text. It would be like all the like where, where would you go? I mean, like, so for example, like um, Emmanuel Kant, so that's just what I was reading today for the audiobook. Emmanuel Kant is just horrendous, like actually horrendous, actually gives instructions of how to beat a Negro correctly to inflict the most pain. This is the person we're like guarding up as universal reason and isn't this great. Uh, that, uh, like, honestly, like having read all this stuff, um, and I, I did a lot about the Enlightenment, uh, before this, to, before I wrote the book, I was like, well, you know, you, just, you should you still keep it, but then you want to contextualize it. Nah, just burn it, get rid of it, throw it in the bin. Like, honestly, it's terrible. It's, the, it's not just a bit racist. The whole structure of the knowledge is racist. And if we want any, if we want, if we want to go any, we should just dash it away and go read something else because there's so many other things that we could do. So that would be, forget contextualize, just take it out and let's just move on. Like, that's where I'm at now because it's, it's that damaging that this knowledge is. Because you just there's, there's, there's not it's not redeemable, right? Like it's not it's not it's, it's not redeemable. It's like when you actually start reading these scholars, you're basically trying it's like trying to find sense on a YouTube channel. Like that's how crazy it is. This is this that dash it away and go read something else. I I agree. Uh, throw the throw them away, burn them. Um, when I was doing my um, humanities degree, um, I, I had a module that was all around English literature. And we had to read, so I, I, can't, I can't remember the name of the book. I think it was called something like Orinoco or something like that. It was just poor. And this is a piece of English literature that you have to read. And it's, a, they call him the noble savage. And immediately, I mean, this is what we're reading in, 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 in the 2000s. And this is being hailed as a good piece of British literature. It's throw it away. There is absolutely nothing to learn from these books. No amount of closed reading will give you any insight to the noble savage. It's just, it's, it's a way to keep that racist narrative alive, but call it something else. Let's check, burn them. Um, anybody else want I, I can't do books that I cannot do racist English literature where they're referring to black people as, um, you know, the, 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 the colored, it's not even colored or anything like that. These are really like offensive terms, the funny looking and the, it's, it's, it's poor. And I think institutions need to really um, address that. That's why we have POC societies and that's why we have uh, black studies and, and that's why we have us because it is about continued resistance. Okay, I'm gonna put it to you, Ash. What do you think about that question? Anything you wanna add? I kind of forgot the question. 
I went on a rant. I'm so no, sorry. No, no, okay. Um. So I just I I I take a breath on this one and I give it to someone else and then. Okay, I, Sarah, quickly, and then we'll take the next question. Please, please repeat the question, Sarah. Please. Uh, can you repeat the question for me? So how do we? Could you repeat? Uh, how do we confront the ethics behind continued institutionalization of a racist text like Heart of Darkness? Um, hmm. I don't think, okay, so, you know, I ruffle feathers anyway, so I don't care. I don't think um, we are supposed to essentially change anything within society. That's just my own personal view. I believe we're supposed to change things within ourselves. Um, for me, the institutions, from what we can see, are clearly deeply entrenched in institutionalized racism. Um, and there is no actual incentive for them to change. Um, yeah, there's no incentive for them to change. I don't know if I could give Oxford an incentive to change their, um, unless, you know, this is not what I'm actually advocating, by the way, unless there's some kind of violent retribution and somebody is holding a gun to someone's head and says, change it right now, or you've got to change it. But even then, that does not change the history of these kind of things. So I don't necessarily think it's for us to change it. I think it's for us to change ourselves. I think it's for us to do for ourselves. I think it's for us to only focus on ourselves and we would like to change. And um, I think with that, we, for me, with the knowledge of understanding, um, for want of a better term, a snake is always going to be a snake. If trying to change a snake's character doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I could stay here for 1,500 years trying to change the character of a snake. And it's like, well, I could have taken time out to maybe understand the snake, you know, maybe understand its environment. But I think ethically, sorry, go on, sorry. Ethically, these 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 texts are very very problematic, and unless done, unless used and contextualized, like how Femi's done it, we're just left with these texts that are used, especially on um, literature degrees, uh, humanity degrees, it, even I think some sociology degrees. They using these texts as the baseline so straight away you're going in and you're being indoctrinated with 19th or 20th 19th century 20th century racism Can I just add but that, sorry, sorry but that is what this thing is built on and so <laughs> I, just I can take time ethically I, right, no, no, no listen I don't I don't disagree with you don't think I'm disagreeing with you I'm saying I find time for myself to change the things that I think I can actually change guys we are running out of time Shanti quickly and then um can we get some questions directly for the panel because I think we've literally got less than 10 minutes left so I do want to Try and get everyone so I just wanted to go specifically to that point um I think for me it's it's important to critique it anyways I think you can understand that like fundamentally this society isn't going to change like you, you can go towards change but, um, and build towards change but in terms of like the actual literature they're not going to erase it they're not going to get rid of it so I feel like it's important to critique it while simultaneously working towards okay but what can I influence and what can I impact I think both can coexist and I feel like often when we have these conversations we try to see it from like just one perspective like you can do both you can critique whilst working on something else I agree. I, 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 but I think mentally it's a bit of a challenge to read actual racist literature. I was given a piece of work to read recently that was from the 19, early 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. And basically it was a brilliant piece of work, but it was culturally appropriated. It was offensive and this was being performed to five-year-olds in the, it, it, you know, they were black facing, but this piece of work was 
counted as a baseline. So I'm saying if we look at all our, if we look at institutions and we look at fundamentally what all these um, different um, sort of degrees, literatures, texts, whatever, what's being used to teach, they're fundamentally racist. And that's my issue because we are then teaching fundamentally and that's why our curriculum is so white. Okay, moving on. Uh, can we have some questions directly for the panel members, please? Yeah, so our last question is for Femi. Um, how has the making of this amazing film changed you? Um, I mean, it's changed me, as you could see from the film, I've learned a lot, grown a lot in terms of my interactions with the continent and my approach to my activism and the rest of it. Um, and it has kind of, like I say, I think it's, it's, it's shown me in the same way that hopefully the viewers of the film in some way kind of I take them on the similar journey but it's the re it's 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 kind of exposed me to beyond just the books learning from books about what happened and then kind of hearing um from the horse's mouth or maybe the, the grandchild of the horse's <laughs> um mouth um the actual reality of what happened and just kind of bringing that home bringing that reality home um was a transformative experience and it's kind of strengthen my resolve to continue to fight the this monster and and bring this history to light and hopefully um change change things in a positive way so that um it doesn't continue the, the monster of colonialism neo-colonialism um white supremacy etc <laughs> etc et um hopefully that's a that's a that's a that's, that's, that's a good answer comprehensive fabulous Thank you so much, Femi. I just got a few things that I need to say to everybody. Sorry, couldn't get through all your questions, guys, but thank you for joining us. Do continue to spread the word about the film and continue to watch and join in the rest of the panels uh, that are going on during this week. Um, you can follow us on social media and use the hashtags Time to testify, African apocalypse, tour and be a witness, no justice, no peace. Find a local charity. If there's anybody in here who wants to be an ally, please find a local charity petition and or campaign to support the cause of rep rep reparations and decolonizations. Um, Thank you, panel members. You have been amazing. Also, if you're looking for some good literature to read, then you can get Dr. Pro, sorry, Professor Kayindi's book, um, Back to Black, Retelling Black Rad Radicalism for the 21st Century. It's an awesome book. Uh, and we look forward to the new one as well. Also, um, yeah, stay with us, stay blessed and Thank you so much. Panel members, don't just leave just yet. But audience, thank you. You've been amazing and I hope you've enjoyed it. Take care. How do I do this? We have it now? Um, oh, no. I, no, we've still got people in the panel. No, I'm going to take a picture. Um, Guys, you were, oh.